Hi, it's Dr. Lori, and I'm here to help you when you're shopping. So if you're shopping and you saw these things, right, I want you to be able to pick the ones that are going to be most valuable and to know the values, basically. Did you get your loop yet? If you didn't get your loop, go get your loop, okay? I really want you to have your loop when you go shopping. I always think one in the car and one in your purse, or one in the car and one in your pocket, whatever it might be. But get the loop. You really do need it. And of course, you know where to get them. I'll help you do that. But I want to show you this objects on the table. We're going to praise them all. So I want to start over here. I want to start here with this particular crystal piece. This is a crystal decanter, right? So you could put wine in it, spirits in it, whatever it might be. It has, of course, this cut crystal element here for the decoration. The idea of that is so it looks shiny, right? It catches the light. Couple things I want you to always look for. So remove the stopper, look at the stopper, right? Now this stopper has some chips in it. So this particular stopper with the chips in it is gonna be a little problematic. If you're trying to sell it, you want to make sure that you make that clear to someone. Show the picture, okay? You know, be honest about it. I know you will be. So that's one of the things I want you to look for. Also make sure that the stopper, if you're buying this in a thrift store, make sure the stopper matches. So that means it has to fit relatively snug, right? It has to also have the same decoration as on the bottom. If you're looking at decanters, a decanter like that, $150. And you know, one of the folks who got in touch with me to evaluate a similar decanter that he found at a thrift store actually was able to sell it for more than that. So he bought it for a little bit and he resold it with my information. This information will make you money. I want you to be able to do that. And this will make you money too. Look at this piece. This is a nice piece, you know, 1960s. Typical piece for, of course, your high C. Did you ever have high C? I didn't like high C. We had to use those old fashioned can openers for high C. Do you remember that? It came in a big can like that in the 70s, I guess it was, or the 80s. And you had to put in those can openers. You had to put a, you had to open the can on one end and on the other end and then pour it out. Anyway, high C would also be um, mixed in this, or um, Kool-Aid would be mixed in this too. This particular piece is really fine. It's a nice piece. It's really typical vintage. But here's the kicker right over here, cracked. So make sure when you're at the thrift store and you're looking at these pieces that you see whether or not there's a crack. It's hard to find that crack, but that crack's right there at the handle. They'll usually be at the handle because the handle is fused on, right? So this is all molded and then this handle is fused on. So it's an area that has, of course, not as much strength usually as the rest of it. So that's one of the things you want to look for. Value on this piece damaged about $40. In good condition, about $65. So there's the difference in terms of condition condition is important. Then there's this piece. Remember Holly Hobby? Holly Hobby. And if you look at this, you want to look for the Holly Hobby mark. So look at the mark. It's a very, very inexpensive piece of ceramic. So if you picked up this particular cup and you picked up this particular cup, you'd know that they are relatively inexpensive ceramics. They're not great porcelain. They're not highly detailed. They're not hand painted. They're just sort of those types of cups that were for giveaways type of thing. Value on that cup, about seven dollars so holly hobby's popular and that's where the seven dollars is if it were just plain and there's no holly hobby on it probably worth about a buck so that might be the thing you leave at the thrift store right i would anyway Having said that, then I want you to be cognizant of materials like this. That particular piece is called a maquette. And that maquette is very, very desirable. It's made by a very famous American sculptor named Glenna Goodacre. And it is the small scale model for her large public sculpture, the Irish Memorial Monument outside of Philadelphia. And that particular monument spoke about the Irish immigrants coming into, of course, ports like Philadelphia and Boston. This is a maquette, and that maquette raised money for them to get the big public sculpture built by Glenna Goodacre. Um, I was part of the art historical um, the art historical committee for again that particular monument, and this particular piece, which is the maquette to raise money, is worth seven hundred and fifty dollars back in the 90s when it was actually made. Today, that maquette is worth $1,500. Why does it go up in value so much? Because now what you have is a public monument that's in the public domain, and people will look for those. How do you tell? Well, a couple things about pieces like this. You want to look for, in fact, the marks on it, whether it's the signature of the artist or whether it's information about the actual piece. Is it one of five? Is it one of 50? It's usually a low edition number for sculptures. Now, how do you know what it is? It's solid bronze. 
and it has been patinated this green color. This is patina, real patina, not patina like patina on a wooden, you know, like on a wooden uh, table because patina doesn't happen on a wooden table. Patination is the application of color onto a piece of metal sculpture. Has nothing to do with the oily buildup on wood. The technical term for the oily buildup on wood is the oily buildup on wood. <laughs> so all these experts who are telling you it's about patina on that table or that wooden bookcase, that's not what patina is. So make sure you go know your source and make sure you go to the source who knows what's going on and knows the right information. Having said that, this is a really good piece and it is a work of art, basically. Don't forget about works of art. We talk a lot about collectibles here, but it's artwork that's going to be relatively valuable, high in value even. Having said that, then there's costume jewelry, my favorite. I love jewelry. This particular piece, these pieces here are good examples of costume jewelry. Different values though. Some are gold filled. Sometimes it'll say 14 carat or 14 KGB or GF, right? That basically means that it's gold filled or gold overlay. It's a base metal and they dip it in gold. That's what this herringbone chain necklace is, which is about a 24 inch necklace. It's about here. So 30 inches is about at a bust line, if you will. 24 is about here. 20 is usually up near the collar. 16 inches is almost a choker, not quite a choker, but a really nice idea. Knowing where those measurements are is gonna help you. So what you would do is you take your measuring tape while you've got your loop out, cause you're looking for the marks, right? While you've got that loop out, I want you to look and I want you to take that measuring tape out and I want you to, in fact, measure those particular pieces from end to end or clasp to clasp. Make sure the clasp works in the thrift store because if it doesn't work, then you gotta go be bothered to getting another clasp. You don't wanna do that either. Make sure the clasps work. If it is in more an expensive enough or an important enough piece of costume jewelry or real jewelry at the thrift store that you say, hey, I'm gonna invest in the new clasp, then certainly buy it. So this particular piece is worth about $25 because it is gold filled, but it is relatively long. Then there's this, these are faux pearls and the clasp opens up at that large sort of half moon or lunette pearl-esque piece at the uh, clasp at the, at the middle. And it's a double strand. They're not real pearls, right? And I've taught you how to tell real pearls. Weight has something to do with it. Luster has something to do with it, right? But I want you to look at that particular piece. That particular piece, they're faux, F-A-U-X, also known as fake, right? They're fake, but they're very good. They're a good fake. They date from the 1950s, early 60s, and value on that bracelet is about $65. That's a nice piece too. The next one is this earring set. Those are actual crystals that are beads and they are woven together. So the bead is with a, a string and a needle actually beaded through to make the actual piece. They're clip on earrings for the set, $25 for the set. They date to the middle part of the 1900s as well. So those aren't high, high value, but they have a lot of style, a lot of flair, and lots of people are collecting, mainly millennials and younger folks are collecting costume jewelry they like costume jewelry and they're not afraid they're going to lose it. This other piece was actually within costume jewelry um, and that piece is also gold overlay or vermeil. You've heard that term, right? Gold overlay. That was the actual five petaled flower, but in the middle of the flower is actually a piece of white jade. So you've got a little bit of jade, that semi-precious stone that's been carved in in the center, and then you've got, of course, the actual flower as well. Value on that piece, about $50. Other pieces on the table that are relatively common, you're gonna see them at the um, thrift store, at the flea market, at the yard sale. And these are some that I might say, maybe you could pass up, the squirrels. The squirrels that are also salt and pepper shakers. They're made in Japan. They're souvenir types of things. You know, oh, we went camping at Lake Winnipesaukee. You know, or we went to New Hampshire. We went to the cabin, that kind of thing. These are mass produced, usually in Japan, sometimes in China. They're very, very desirable. Uh, they're very, very common. I'm sorry, they're not very desirable. And value on that is usually somewhere around five to $10. They're cute. You bring them home, you know, tell somebody that you, didn't forget about them on your vacation when you were taking the RV someplace, that kind of thing. So value on that's rather low. Um, and it's low because it's low quality ceramic. The other market that has really changed a lot has been other 
souvenir pieces like the salt and pepper shakers. Those are from Florida. Everybody in the 1960s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they go to Florida, they bring back salt and pepper shakers because everybody could use some extra salt and pepper shakers. And basically that's what you're looking at there. Also made in Japan, very low quality. They're decorative and that's really all they've got going for them. People did collect salt and pepper shakers, but now we're seeing those really flood the market, particularly on places like Etsy and eBay, Ruby Lane, um, lots of places like that, Craigslist, the Let Go and Mercari apps, all those places. Value on those pieces together, about $15 for the set. Don't break up the set because nobody wants salt without its pepper. <laughs> anyway, similarly, one of the other things that a lot of you ask me about, a lot of you ask me about, is Asian ceramics. I will tell you that the Chinese are making and have made for years many, many, many pieces of Asian ceramics. So Asian ceramics like this particular piece. This piece is unmarked, but made in China, okay? Now this piece does look like nice quality porcelain only because the glaze. The glaze has basically been done very nicely and they've remembered to try to fool you to make the, even the underside of the lid very nicely glazed. So they took their time with the glaze, they took their time with the application of this faux gilt, right? And basically this is a piece that looks quite nice and that's great, but in terms of quality, it is not of high quality at all. And there's many, many pieces that are not of particular high quality. So how do you tell? I want you to look at the details. I want you to look at the color of the actual clay and I want you to look at the details. Very, very shiny like this typically is not indicative of an old piece of Asian ceramics or a valuable piece of Asian ceramics. So too much glare, you better beware, right? I want you to be aware of that when it comes to Asian ceramics. This particular piece is worth about $15 and it's mass produced to look Asian. That's what it is. Then you have this set. This particular set, this is a whole dinnerware set. This piece is cup and saucer, of course, and then you can see this bowl. Now, it has a colonial revival look. Let's talk a little bit about time period and market, right? So, colonial revival, very popular. Every time we have a bicentennial, centennial, sesquicentennial, event, right? So think of it this way. 1776 is when the, um, the fight for independence, right? 1776. 1876 is the centennial, 100 years later. Then you got 1926, which would be 150 year anniversary of our country. 17, and 1976 was our bicentennial or 200 years of our country. So when we get to 2026, we're going to have, of course, another one of these celebrations. The colonial revival, or interest in colonial things, spinning wheels, Windsor chairs, you know, pieces of ceramic like this, were very popular in the 1926 era and the 1976 era. And that's what you're looking at here. These particular pieces of, again, colonial inspired. You can see the little figures, of course, of the colonial figures on the cup. You can see, of course, the colonial kind of interior at the hearth, on the bowl, that kind of thing. So that's what I want you to think about. Think about what time period it's from and whether or not we're coming up on an anniversary when it would spike in value. So if you sold this now, it's not gonna be worth as much as if you just wait six years until we have another spike of that, again, um, of, uh, again that 250th anniversary time, which is gonna happen in 2026. Value on this particular set, if it's a service for 12, service for 12 for this set today is worth about $200. In 2026, it's gonna be worth about $450. So it's worth it to wait. You know, you've got storage space, go put it in a tub somewhere and wait for a couple of years. Anyway, then we have these dolls. These dolls are from Poland. And in the 1950s and early 60s, it was really popular for people to get international dolls. It was kind of like fruit of the month, I don't get fruit of the month because I don't eat enough fruit to do that. Like if I got chocolate of the month, that would be okay. But basically doll of the month or basically the international dolls is where you would actually get or order another doll for your granddaughter or your daughter or whatever. So they'd have a doll collection, very popular in the 1950s from all over the world. These dolls were made in Poland and you can see that they have what is called cultural dress, right? So they kind of look like what you would expect peasant folks from that part of the world to be dressed in. And then you have some that look like, of course, this one looks has a little beret, looks like French. 
uh, a French person, the German person here with the little Lederhosen kind of outfit. And I've been to all of these places, and let me tell you, the girls who are wearing the Lederhosen, wow, they could be models. They're amazing at, at of course, Oktoberfest. It's a lot of fun. Having said that, you're looking at these pieces, and these are not the specific international dolls made from specific countries, but these are the dolls that were really popular and inexpensive in the 1950s and 60s. So middle-class families could get the international-looking dolls for their kids, too. Value on these, they're about $20 per doll today. As long as they're all wood, they're pa hand painted, the wood is all painted like the shoes are painted red kind of thing, and as long as the costume is intact too. I'm gonna leave you with the last piece, which is the cowbells. The cowbells are really quite fine. They're pretty nice. They actually are a big one and a small one, and the idea would be that the cow would wear it around its neck and then you would hear the cow coming. These particular bells are only about 40 years old, so they are vintage. Remember, everyone goes, oh, Dr. Lurie, praise my husband, he's an antique. Well, you know what, he's vintage. <laughs> if you're 100 years old or less, you're vintage, and these are vintage too. About 40 years old, these are about $20, and you find these a lot in farmer's auctions. So if you go to a farmer's auction, you're looking for that nice dough box or that farmer's table, or you're looking for, you know, parts, you know, sometimes people like wagon wheels or parts for their laundry room, like old scrubbing boards and such. You can see these kinds of things there. So $15 for the small and about $18 for the large. Don't forget when you're in that thrift store or when you're shopping, think about materials. Remember to look for condition. If it's, it's, a, if it's a terrible thing that you wouldn't put in your own house, don't expect that it's gonna be in good condition for somebody else. It might be hard for you to sell. If you're a buyer and you're thinking, hey, I wanna decorate my house with it, remember that Colonial Revival is gonna come back big. And of course, things from the mid 20th century or the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s are always in style. Well, it's Dr. Lori and I'm in trouble with the editors because I said we're gonna praise everything on the table. <laughs> And I forgot the last things. I don't know how I did that. I'm sorry. So I'm back to tell you about the last things on the table. I bet a lot of you noticed. I bet a lot of you were like, oh, Dr. Laura, you missed those. Well, here I am. I didn't miss those. Well, I did, but the people who helped me didn't. Anyway, so here are the three pieces of jewelry. They look like plastic. They might be Bakelite. How do you tell? So that's what I'm here to do these last three appraisals for you. So these, first of all, look by, for color. So when you're looking for Bakelite, Bakelite is gonna be much more valuable than plastic. I want you to look for color. So color like bright, bright colors, like yellow, like green, like bright red, you know, uh, candy apple, uh, candy apple um, you know, red, or uh, orange, bright colors. And I want you to think about Bakelite a couple of different ways. First of all, remember it is a chem, basically it's plastic, but it's a chemical. It is a polymer that's devised by a gentleman named Bakelond. He names it for himself. I always think that's great. So, you know, if I had kids, I'd name them all Lori. You're all gonna be Lori now. <laughs> but anyway, so this particular piece is a piece of Bakelite and it's a good example. The reason, one of the ways you can tell using these others is this interior, which is flat. So that's one of the ways to tell. Not all Bakelite will be like that. Not every bracelet that's Bakelite will be that like that, but that's one of the ways that you might have a clue that you're looking at Bakelite. The other way is very, very easy. I don't like any of these tests that are going to you know, damage your antique, so be careful of those. But the one test that won't damage your antique, if you're trying to identify Bakelite, run this under hot water, get it nice and hot, and take a smell. If you smell formaldehyde, you have Bakelite. Okay. Now, versus the Bakelite bracelet is worth just about $55, the green one. These two are plastic. They're round all the way around. They don't have that flat interior like the Bakelite one happens to have. If you had plastic bracelets and you did that same test and you ran it under hot water, it's going to smell like white vinegar. So it's pretty simple. You probably know the chemical smell of formaldehyde. You remember chemistry, you were in the lab, you smelled formaldehyde or biology when you had to dis disinfect, dissect the frog. I don't know, did everybody do that? I did that, I was terrible at all that stuff. Anyway, these are plastic. These date to about the 1970s and they're trying to look like Bakelite, but they're not, they're just regular plastic. Value on these, about $10 each. Now, some people will sell them for five bucks, you know, but basically retail value, 
about $10 each for these. You might be able to get two or three for 15, that kind of thing. If you're negotiating off about them, try to buy them in groups. So there's the last one that I missed. Sorry, guys. I'm Dr. Lori. I hope you learned a little bit about how do you value these objects. I want to show you what to look for. Have some fun while we do it. Thanks for watching.